Dear colleagues, good morning, good early morning to those who is uh, with us in our western part. Uh, good afternoon to those who are in Asia. And uh, we are here in Yekaterinburg with a small group with those who sit here with us offline in campus, and we are happy about that. Unfortunately, we can't demonstrate our Russian hospitality from the heart of Russia, because we are actually at the border of Europe and Asia, and that is why we are pleased to discuss with you what has changed uh, during the last two years of pandemic crisis. Well, actually, one year ago, I had to look up what is new normality in Oxford Dictionary, and it appeared to be something really, really new. Пришлось в Оксфордском словаре смотреть новые слова. Но оказалось, что они пришли к нам навсегда. Ну, навсегда это часто не так долго, как кажется, но в любом случае спасибо что тем, кто к нам офлайн подключен здесь на, в кампусе. Надеюсь, что сегодня нам удастся обсудить с бизнес-школами с Востока, с Запада, из России, из Азии, а также с образовательных платформ и ассоциации бизнес-образования. Надеюсь, нам удастся с вами обсудить, есть ли у нас новые инструменты и решения в эту эпоху, в эту эпоху полной цифровизации всех процессов, поскольку сейчас мы опять вынуждены общаться онлайн и также обсудим первые последствия для университета с точки зрения устойчивого развития и цифрового неравенства, которое как бы нам и не позволяет обеспечивать равное развитие студентов и других заинтересованных стран. Надеюсь, что мы сможем разработать возможные инструменты и обсудим успешные практики, совместно созданные в течение последнего года. Я предлагаю сделать два раунда, и в первом раунде я хотела бы представить всех выступающих буквально вкратце, Два-три ключевых слова. Назовите, пожалуйста, ключевые тренды, которые описывают онлайн-образование в той части света, где вы находитесь. Я начну с себя, потому что я еще и сама не представилась. Меня зовут Жанна Беляева, и я научный директор Института экономики и управления Уральского федерального университета. И последние два года были просто потрясающим опытом но при этом я очень скучаю по занятиям офлайн, живую, и не думаю, что мы... Роберт Галир, Senior Advisor, Equisent EFMD Program Accreditation, EFMD Global UK. Rob. What are those two, three words that you would give us about their pandemic and online? Oh, wow, fantastic. It's always good to be positive about the future. Then um, I bring you back to our audience here. Сергей Мисаедов, Director of Institute of Business Studies, RANEPA, President of Russian Association of Business Education. So what are those two, three words that describe us in Russian business education? First of all, uh, thank you very much for this fantastic opportunity to discuss a really very important uh, topic today. And I'm honored to participate in this session with the outstanding people. And using this opportunity informally, I want to say hello, Natalia. I never met you, but I talked to Tim Meskin uh, so, sort of a week ago. My, my best, uh, best greetings to him once again. And it's a pleasure to get acquainted with you. And Bob, uh, it's, it's, it's a great honor to meet you here. I, I, it seems to me we, we didn't have a chance to meet, but I talked to Eric also a couple of weeks ago because maybe you know that to go, together with Matthew Wood, we, I, I, I'm president of RABE, Russian Association of Business Education. We published the first issue of Global Focus in Russian, and it is located now at RABE 
uh, websites so that our audience that is preliminary 8% of which do not speak fluent English now has access to the to the ideas of, we, of the world business education. So and global the, focus is the two words, I guess. Exactly, exactly. And now about the new normal. Just two remarks, and then I consider that during the discussion we wish to return to them and discuss them in, in, in more details. First of all, it seems to me that we are coming to the new environment, and for today's day, principally important, at least for the Russian business education, are several words. Word number one is environment, word number two is balance, Word number three is third mission of business schools, and word number four is trust in our partners and in our cooperation, etc. As far as environment, without going into details, I consider that WUCA environment is going away, and bunny environment, brittle, anxious, uh, non, uh, non-linear and uh, uh, incomprehensible. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to recollect the exact words after, after, after the letters. It is coming and we have to rethink it because it is new. And the most important thing is when small facts, small, small actions can change the whole world and sometimes very big efforts bring us to almost nothing. Uh, I'm not critical. I was following this conference on, uh, on the climate and on the environment and on decarbonization. Well, once again, I'm not critical. We, 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 we are prime champion. I mean, my business school, we are doing our best. But I was sort of not fully satisfied with what, what what happened by the end. It seems to me that all the countries of the world could could move faster. So this is environment balance, new technologies, and I got this word balance from uh, Eric Cornell's presentation. He he told us we cannot cut something from business education, but new balance in between hard and soft, new balance in between local and global, new balance in between relations uh, uh, with professors and with business, etc. Many positions, and we have to rethink business education together. Third mission, the what is so fragile, and after pandemic years, we can feel it very, very well. And so we have to bring and implement the ideas of prime principles of responsible management education to our programs. And final, trust. Uh, the, uh, the questionnaire in our country proves that the level of trust inside Russian business is not sufficient. We're thinking how to improve it via education. And it seems to me that now mutual trust in the world is going down too. So I think that we have to discuss those four positions and at least within Russian Association of Business Education, we consider that uh, those positions are the major points which we shall try to keep in focus. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Sergey, for a very extended uh, topic of uh, our digital presence in this world. And you can see that actually, while in Russia, we have we have very extended meaning for everything, even between the world, and we are trying to position ourselves international and globally. But I would like to keep the logic, and I would like to present all the speakers while with me in the audience, we also have Sergei Roshin, who is Vice Rector of High School of Education, Head of Lab for Labor Market Studies, Moscow. Uh, hello, uh, dear colleagues, uh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to speak Russian, so I'm, uh, please uh, um, speak in Russian. Я очень рад, что мы сегодня можем поговорить. 
Um, so only um, three speakers are offline and the rest are online. And we are discussing how the education is feeling in this uh, technological model, taking into account the challenges and uh, complications uh, and problems we are now facing. This is an, uh, a very interesting conversation and I am not only in charge of uh, uh, the uh, labor markets uh, laboratory, I'm also vice rector for education at my university. And uh, from this perspective, I will try uh, to uh, conceptualize the experience we've had over these two years. and member services ACSB. The floor is yours for two, three words. Thank you very much, Natalia. You pinned that. And the next speaker, speaker who is very welcome to be here, Mark Thomas, Associate Dean and Director of Graduate Programs, Grenoble Ecole de Management, France. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jana. Thank you for the invitation and uh, to Katerina as well for, for, for organizing this. Um, actually, I think Natalie's word of agility <laughs> um, is, is an excellent summary. So um, um, I can't do better than that. I think it was a little bit of chaos to begin with, if we go back, honestly, to um, a year and a half ago. Um, and then, you know, most of us have adapted, most business schools, most universities have adapted quite well um, to, to actually doing that in a very short space of time, something we weren't prepared for. Um, there is still a lot of uncertainty. We're still in the eye of the storm and events with lockdowns in different places are, are proving that. Um, but there's opportunity as well. Um, and there are opportunities for, for schools to, um, to develop um, um, and maybe I'll talk later, but I think there are others, um, we're talking about technology, but there are social issues as well that also need to be addressed um, as we move forward, because they will be very important to, to our future success and well-being. Thank you very much, Mark. And indeed, that's uh, something in between agility and technologies, which we are trying to concur and trying to be successful in that. Mm. And uh, that is why the next speaker is uh, George Nikachev, Director for Russia and CIS at Coursera. George, what is your opinion on what's going on in your responsibilities and organization? Thank you very much. We are traveling to France again, but to a different part of France to uh, I present Vyacheslav Dmitriev, who is Associate Dean for Faculty Relations, Rennes School of Business in France. Slava, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Well, I also was thinking about maybe passion for online modes and for digital transformation. Uh, but, well, I would like to check if that's in line with our next expert, Duran Javara, president of Zagreb School of Economics and Management, Croatia, that's eastern part of Europe. Well, what are these key words for you um, that describe online education in two words today? Hello to all participants. This uh, unique situation with uh, pan worldwide Do pandemic. Do you have uh, Jura? Uh, one moment. It's okay. okay. This uh, situation with worldwide pandemic uh, uh, give us uh, incentives and strong push to explore all opportunity of new technology in our uh, field of activity. We see a strong impact on a different field of our activity. And uh, my conclusion is that uh, university is uh, more than knowledge. And uh, we are very optimistic uh, for post pandemic uh, period that students will enjoy to uh, be back in a campus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we are definitely happy to see students back in campus. Well, here at Ural Federal University, they are all online starting from this week. So we look forward to get them back as well. Uh, but in this case, well, I would like to travel to Asian part of our panel. And I would like to present uh, uh, Professor Kanjuan Lu, Dean of Silk Business School, Shanghai University. Jelu, what is it for you in China? Are you still fully online and what are their keywords? Thank you very much. Well, that's interesting that uh, effectiveness was um, announced the first in this uh, dialogue. So, and uh, we stay in Asia, and uh, I give the floor to Professor Si Min Han, Director of the Research Institute for Asian Enterprises, uh, Solbridge University. Well, what are those uh, key words for you? Uh, hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be a part of the plenary session. Um, I will two trend two words. Well, one positive note is a uh, is a global reach. I will go into more details uh, when I have uh, in the in the second round. And as a, a negative note, as a, as a challenge is uh, creating networking online, uh, networking between the faculty and and the students and. Uh, especially the networking among students. So that's the, uh, the, the, the key challenge uh, we are facing at the moment. We're working on it. So we'll, I will go into more details in the second round. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, our network is going smoothly from Yekaterinburg, from our hybrid studio, when we have a little bit of snow, and there are other parts of the world, for example, the next speaker is enjoying Mediterranean climate right now in Cyprus, uh, Professor Angelika Kakinaki, Dean, uh, School of Business, University of Nicosia. Uh, what is the situation there? What are the key words you can... Thank you so much. I hope yeah. you can hear me clearly. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I would have to say that uh, we live uh, through an educational transformation. It has been accelerated by the pandemic. Um, and it is um, our duty and responsibility as a school of business 
as uh, universities uh, faculty to uh, identify and reshape what added value we could give to our stakeholders. And by added value, I don't mean only monetized value, but I'm referring also to social value. Um, I'm referring to uh, the flexibility to offer students uh, the opportunity to study no matter from where or when. Um, and um, even scientific value because um, the digitization process enables us to reach beyond um, our current uh, physical environment and possibly develop uh, programs um, depending on the topic that could not be solely uh, uh, viable on local resources. So this is an extremely interesting opportunity for, for us who are in a very small country in the crossroads of uh, Asia, Africa and Europe. And um, we are trying to define how we could build our ecosystem of knowledge and learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the key words uh, which I learned here, well, thank you for the world ecosystem, Angelica, because ecosystem is pinned with agility, with leadership, with passion, with IT products, uh, and also with networking and uh, with um, all the tools that connect that all effectively together. We also have a business school specialist uh, here, Coursera. I'd like to present Andy Poole. If you have um, something to add to the definition of um, our VUCA to BANI uh, environment. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, yeah, I, I think ecosystem is a great word, actually. But um, I, I would say um, opportunity, um, because I think there really is an opportunity out there um, at the current time. Um, but I would also say mindset because it strikes me that only those institutions or leaders of institutions who have a growth mindset will fully tap into that opportunity. Um, and we're very fortunate that we have a number of partners here present today who we've seen um, with that growth mindset. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. And uh, well, so far we have a very optimistic picture, I would say. But um, while I looked through some of the research uh, conducted by Deloitte, for example, and they're saying that uh, positive business schools rhetoric is not in place anymore because what is happening the second year in a row has led to kind of digital inequality for business education. And uh, in such respect, we are looking for positive transformation, but obviously we want our students back to school, uh, to campus. But we have developed some new ways on how to develop innovative business school strategy and how to use internationalization in their virtual era. And I would like to move on to the next part of our plenary talk. And uh, I would like to address uh, Bob Galeers about the experience of schools in Europe, how they cope and how they develop these innovative strategies and what are probably the best examples, how we can learn to, you know, to avoid too positive rhetoric, but be optimistic and efficient. Bob. Thanks very much, Shana. Can you hear me all? Uh, well, everyone. Uh, good. Um, I uh, took Shana's uh, comment about using two words literally when I introduced my, I didn't even have a chance to introduce myself, but um, I wanted to give just two examples um, of what schools are doing. One of the great benefits of being part of the EFMD network is that you get to uh, interact with colleagues from around the world. And um, those of you who, who may know me, uh, my background is in the UK, but I've also spent a lot of time in Australia and in most recently in the United States. And actually my two examples are from the Americas, Shannon, not from Europe. Um, again, I wanted really to uh, reinforce the point that one size doesn't fit all. The local circumstances, something which uh, other colleagues have talked about already, um, 
really impact the way that uh, business schools are dealing um, with the new normal, uh, to use your words, Shana. Um, let me start with just setting the scene, uh, and I'll try to be quick because I know that time is short. Um, one school is in North America. I won't name them because of confidentiality reasons. And another is in South America. Um, the obstacles I mentioned. Um, in North America, these were mostly in the mind, um, attitudinal. Uh, potentially, uh, my North American colleagues will forgive me for being a Brit uh, and um, describing them in this way, but perhaps a lack of interest and uh, appreciation of the rest of the world, the individual, paramount. Um, the, the relationship with technology was uh, what kind of one-to-one. -one. Um, one's interacting with the, one's own computer and seeing life from that perspective. Um, but also a very keen competition locally. Uh, the school in South America, um, sense of isolation, uh, geographic isolation, um, problems in the economy, lacking resources, um, not very particularly well known, uh, except uh, nationally and, and regionally. Um, opportunities uh, to uh, interact internationally were limited for students and faculty alike, few partnerships. Um, and so the experiences that they had for students and faculty interacting uh, internationally were, were limited. So let's go on to the opportunities side of things. Um, the, uh, this emerged from the work of a particular professor. It wasn't a sort of top-down strategy, but uh, this professor was uh, teaching a strategy course. And there was an existing relationship with a South American institution. Um, so the professor uh, interacted with a colleague in South America to develop a strategy course which used cases from um, not just North America, but South America, um, uh, set uh, assignments um, with teams of students, mixed teams of students from the two institutions. There was the benefit of a re relatively similar time zone, so there wasn't those kinds of problems. Um, and one, what were the benefits arising from this? Well, one was the ability to interact with students from another uh, country, uh, sometimes speaking in different languages, Spanish or, or English, um, appreciation of, uh, in informal discussions, the social side of things in those virtual teams, um, uh, enabling an under, a better understanding of society, of the different economies and histories of the, of the two nations, um, and leading to um, uh, the development of partnerships, both on an individual base, uh, basis in relation to not just the faculty involved with this course, but between the students. Um, with uh, leading actually to, to um, faculty research partnerships um, and leading to, through word of mouth, to the development of similar courses, not just in the area of strategy, um, uh, but across the curriculum in, in relation to the use of technology um, uh, in this new normal. Very different uh, environment um, as I indicated in South America. Uh, but what happened? Um, the use of technology arose primarily from a, a natural disaster that happened a couple of years before the pandemic, 
which actually related to a flood and it, it led to the institution concerned uh, having to use technology just to develop uh, to, to run the, their programs um, here um, Using that experience um, with limited resources, um, we're able to utilize technology to uh, not just run their courses, but to involve visiting professors internationally, um, something that they were unable to do before, which led to a change in content, not just in terms of delivery, but the content of courses with um, a greater international focus, leading to, to um, increased um, uh, visibility on the part of that particular school um, and uh, a rise in its own um, standing, not just locally and in the, in the region, but internationally, leading to, to accreditation. Um, I, I won't go on, but um, I wanted really to, to focus on a, on a couple of things arising from those two cases. And I know I've, I've, I've dealt with them very briefly. Um, but if you, first of all, I, I'm, a, I'm not a believer of this thing called best practice. There are good practices in the context of, um, uh, within different contexts. And, and institutions are coming at this from, from different backgrounds. One pri quite privileged, the other underprivileged in these two cases. Um, there's a lot of talk about localization as opposed to, uh, against, or, or rather de-globalization. Um, I don't believe that that is actually happening, um, but I do see the potential of information technology to widen vistas, um, in the first case, in opening the mind to uh, opportunities um, to interact internationally. Uh, but, but secondly, also there's an opportunity to, to think about things like sustainability. These are um, themes that have emerged in, in the introductions that, that, that individuals gave to us uh, as we first started talking about this topic. Um, in this session. Um, less short-term travel, but perhaps longer-term relationships being formed, which will reduce our carbon footprints uh, in relation to still pursuing an international agenda. So I thought I would just talk about the obstacles that schools will be facing, which are different from one location to another, and then the way in which opportunities are, are taken, which can lead to positive outcomes um, from uh, uh, this terrible pandemic, which is uh, affecting the world as we speak. So I'll stop there, Dana, because I know that time is short. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, well, yes, I share with you, I'm with you, and that, that one size doesn't fit it all. And of course, it varies over the continents. And indeed, we don't know what would be the best case for any part of the world. Probably the best case is the best graduate, uh, which has got lots of employability skills. And uh, indeed, here there are sustainability effects. Of course, being members of uh, United Nations Prime and being Prime Champions, we are all doing lots of efforts to be on the same track and to develop our students. But um, I know that uh, there are lots of impacts that I expected from business schools and all the stakeholders. And I would like to address Natalia Ilina um, to talk about the um, approach of ACSB to those issues and leadership under their umbrella of business schools worldwide as well. Natalia, Thank the you so much. Yes, thank you so much. Well, first of all, um, I would like to start with our special saying at ACSB when referring to the new 2020 standards. We can apply here on the online education as well. That became our new norm. And I believe uh, it says these new standards are not a revolution, but evolution. Thus, change is a norm. It is an organic process in the high 
business uh, education and business schools need to embrace it as a part of their mission. And um, business environment is undergoing a profound change spurred by powerful demographic shifts, pandemic environment, et cetera, et cetera, we know better. In this context, not surprisingly, the same factors impacting business are also changing higher education. In this, um, from the ACSB international perspective, standards and processes are designed not only to validate the quality of business education and impactful research, but also to provide um, leadership encouragement and support for change in business schools. Our standards provide a platform for business uh, schools to, to work together to force engagement, accelerate innovation, amplify impact on business education, and create a shared sense of responsibility to impact society positively. That's very important. Societal impact has to be in the heart of each business school mission. Um, based on the ACSB research, well, maybe um, slides would be helpful here to show the next slide, please. The next slide. Yes, thank you so much. Based on the ACSB research, defining world-class business school, apply a list of five common opportunities that help them nurture sustainability, dynamic change, and beneficial digitalization. As you can see, these schools are catalysts of innovation, leaders on leadership, um, hubs of lifelong learning, co-creators of knowledge, enable, um, enablers of global prosperity, which sounds amazing and challenging at the same time, of course. In the vision development process, these identify five opportunities can bring the vision to life and each one has fast benefits for the Russian and international schools as well, we believe at ACSB and what we saw from our experience. Um, if we can switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. So when referring to the topic and specifically the balance to sustain impact on society at a larger scale, effective quality business education cannot be achieved when either academic or professional engagement is absent or when they do not intersect in a meaningful way. This is why ACSB encourages an appropriate intersection of academic and professional engagement that is consistent with the quality in the context of the school mission. Moreover, based on the ACSB research, as you can see, among top 10 workplace skills, of 2025 business schools have to provide our, and I highlighted them, technology use, monitoring and control, as well as technology design and programming. So therefore, just in conclusion, we at ACSB believe that reshaping and innovating the digitalization strategies of business schools is an integral and organically crucial part of a balanced, sustainable impact on society in business schools. Yeah, that would be my input. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, um, I, I do share this idea. Thank you for this input, because we actually at Graduate School of Economics and Management, we made all students who study economics to insert sustainability part in their graduation thesis, even though if they work with scrotting cut technologies, they have to understand what is the impact on the world of tomorrow. And uh, we think that there is a requirement from the market. And I would like to address uh, um, Han uh, as the next speaker. Uh, is it the same trend for you in uh, uh, South Korea? And whether sustainability is one of their digital prerequisites and whether sustainability is the new digital in their pandemic world? Professor Simon Han. Uh, yes, I I got confused. You want me? To, I, I I was gonna present uh, some sustainability issues, but the I when I have uh, the itinerary, and I was supposed to discuss the 
uh, what was it? The, the um, give me a different topic. <laughs> I don't know which tune I, I have to play. Okay, so what should I do? I just since I prepared this, I just mentioned this one uh, sustainability issues, and um, this is uh, just the the, um, the findings actually. The, I did a study a couple of years ago, a few years ago, in the Korean firms in in Vietnam, and this is some of the findings I had from the my study, and we were looking at the 116 Korean firms uh, in Vietnam and look at the, their uh, CSR activities and why they are doing it and uh, how how they are doing it and uh, how do you evaluate them. Okay? And what I found out is just uh, spent a few minutes, I just find out that uh, Korean firms in Vietnam tend to focus on philanthropic activities and charity. But in the, in the context of emerging country, in the context of uh, a developing country, economic uh, CSR uh, can be still most important corporate obligations. Uh, various uh, studies indicate that uh, economic CSR is more important than uh, philanthropic activities, especially in the uh, emerging markets, such as uh, job creation and human resource development, and also uh, working with the local uh, industry and uh, promoting local industry. But Korean firms, they tend to focus on philanthropic activities and charity. Uh, while economic uh, activities, economic responsibilities uh, can be the most important public aid in the context of uh, uh, Vietnam and emerging countries. And another, uh, another finding, interesting finding I had from the, let me get to my script, on the Korean firms in Vietnam is, we were looking at what kind, uh, what types of firms are showing uh, more uh, satisfaction and satisfaction uh, with uh, their CSR activities in, in Vietnam. And uh, we found that the Korean firms cooperating with the third parties because many, uh, many uh, Korean firms, even though they want to engage in sustainability and responsibility activities, they often lack capabilities. So when they work with the third parties like NGOs and the local government and the local agencies, uh, they tend to perceive more positive outcomes from the CSR activities. And also we found that the Korean firms conducting CSR closely related to their line of their lines of business tend to perceive more positive outcomes from CSR. Let's example is that. Samsung, they were engaging in teaching uh, computer skills uh, to uh, uh, low income, uh, low income uh, students. And they, they, they tend to perceive more uh, positive outcomes from this. And another uh, interesting finding I had from the uh, study is most effective mode of local CSR is we are looking at how do, how do they design the local CSR, and there's a number of alternatives. It's purely local adaptation and the purely global CSR platform. And also uh, is a CSR is carried out by the local subsidiaries with the, in the global context and so on. So what we found out is the most effective mode of local CSR is a global CSR platform with the local adaptations. As you, when I talked to, and also I did some studies on these issues, when you're doing a, a sustainability, responsibility activities, there's a two important stakeholders. One is a global stakeholders and the other is a local stakeholders. Sometimes they have a different agenda. For instance, climate change is a very important global agenda. But sometimes in, if you go to emerging country, Climate change might not be, it's still important, but there are other important activities that are needed in the local context. So 
there is conflict between a, a global agenda and the local agenda. At the same time, who you go after, you want to please, you want to develop relationship uh, with, the, with the global stakeholders or local stakeholders. For instance, Samsung, there are a lot of great uh, global stakeholders. They have European stakeholders and American stakeholders. Do they want to carry out activities that are expected by global stakeholders? Well, do they need to uh, need to carry out activities that are expected by local stakeholders? So there's a conflict, and many companies is uh, is uh, struggling with uh, how to meet uh, conflicting needs of different stakeholders. And we found that uh, the most effective mode of local CSR is a uh, global uh, CSR platforms developed at the headquarters to make some adaptations uh, by the local subsidiary, but has a more global context with uh, some, uh, some local adaptation. So like a globalization, not, not like a local global, uh, local globalization, so gl localization. So another important, uh, see, important CSR if, uh, effect is related to is increased employee morale and company loyalty. That's what we found out. And so for reason, for this reason, firms, Korean firms tend to focus on communities uh, near their establishment because the, the positive outcome is increased employees' uh, morale and company loyalty. So they don't want to go out remote areas to carry out their sustainability activity. But these are the, some of the uh, findings we have uh, we had from the our study on uh, Korean firms in Vietnam, and the implication for the education is although there are global mandates for responsibility issues, but we need to uh, need to address issues relevant to Asian countries in the emerging market context in the our business education. Thank you. Thank you very much for raising this point of different requirements of different stakeholders worldwide. And that brings us to the idea that actually the impact would be very different even though we are trying to have some standards on business school worldwide. So searching for the new normal societal quality and digital standards might be a very complex idea. And that is why we have to listen not only to their corporation, but also what their students want, what their stakeholders want. And uh, well, how that will reshape their strategies of business schools and where do we need to innovate? That's an open question. And uh, I would like to address to the next speaker, to Andy Poole, so how their digitalization strategies of business schools should be balanced in terms of innovation and uh, how to keep the impact at the society at a larger scale. Andy? Thank you very much. Um, so I think business schools have got a tough job because um, ultimately um, there's your existing stakeholders um, your your kind of traditional, um, in many cases, traditional um, sort of an initial students, so undergraduate students, um, and and obviously they they typically represent a, a large share of income, um, and it's how to keep those students happy, how to remain student centric with those with that group of learners, and then also adapt to the changing environment with other communities in which business schools are, are operating. So, so it's how to how to um, how to adapt to the to the kind of new types of, of of learners who I would I would categorize as increasingly flexible in terms of their their requirements. Um, I would say that they're, they're more disparate. So many top business schools nowadays, you know, they're not looking in their local communities for their learners. They're looking worldwide. Um, and increasingly, it's also about involving um, the community, involving the, the, the kind of national educational um, sort of priorities into that and integrating that. So, so increasingly, we hear about upskilling, we hear about reskilling, and the huge amounts of resources that governments are, are having to, not through choice, but through necessity, 
pump into those areas um, in order to, to ensure that their economies at a national level are competitive. And so, so when I think about business schools in, in this kind of context, it's incredibly difficult for them to balance all those different groups off and, and not prioritize one over the other and ensure that they're remaining student centric to all of those different groups. So I think in order to do that, it's really important um, to be flexible. So I think this was, this was said earlier on, um, it's absolutely essential that business schools are flexible, that business schools are able to adapt and that they work into their model of operation. Um, this kind of flex, um, this, this um, almost like a kind of startup mindset that it's OK to fail in certain areas. It's OK to try things and for them not to be in, entirely successful, because otherwise it's, it's just not going to be impossible. Um, to, to win on all fronts at all times. Um, and so, so kind of what we're seeing um, is that business schools are having to adapt to teaching skills they've never taught before. Um, so increasingly digital skills are, are becoming a priority. Um, so, so that's kind of one of the key things. And, and at the same time as teaching skills that they've never had to teach before, it's about delivering those skills in, in ways that they haven't delivered before. So it's, it's not only face-to-face, -face, it's online, um, it's it's kind of a, a hybrid, which is, you know, for many instructors is a nightmare scenario because you, you, you know, measuring engagement on, on two fronts at the same time is incredibly difficult. It's it's um, synchronous content. It's asynchronous. Um, it's and it's all at the same time when when their staff um, where where their students are going have been going through, you know, un, unexpected amounts of stress and pressure. Um, and so so kind of I think to be in business education right now is is challenging and and i know that you know what when when i when i participate in events with um with deans um and with rectors i mean it's it's quite clear that they use those events as an opportunity to to kind of to almost let off the burden that they've been carrying themselves because they can't always necessarily reveal that to the people that they're around um and so yeah so i think at, like at coursera we have a massive amount of respect um, for all of that, um, and, and hopefully um, we try to, um, you know, to, to provide one solution or one means of, of adding additional flexibility. And, and I think it comes down to, you know, tr trying to be as flexible as possible, being an, as agile as possible to meet all of those disparate needs. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. All their stakeholders having tremendous pressure from the volume of digital information that we are facing with. And of course, uh, uh, such platforms as Coursera help a lot to structure it in uh, visibility and understanding. But we at business schools, when we talk about digital educations, we first start to discuss how structured our courses, how available and visible are they, and uh, whether we can deliver the message well to our stakeholders, not necessarily to students, but also to MBA and to business uh, partners. But is it the only thing that we should worry about? Because of course, in times of digital inequality, and statistics actually says that in some part of the world, uh, more than 90% of uh, stakeholders of students have uh, accessibility to internet and they have more than one computer at home. But actually in some countries, only 30% of students and uh, even of families have one computer which is not enough for digital learning. And that is why the COVID actually brought different aspects. And um, well, we can't reach all those students so the question is, is it enough to be very digital and does it depend on business school or is it something beyond our powers? And well, I understand this is not an easy question, but I would like to move on and uh, I would like to give floor to Mark Thomas, how you are coping with that? Do you have issues with availability of your studies? It's oh wow, what a big question. Um, two hours I've got to reply. Um, 
listen this is a real question it's it's and it's not just the 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 digital it's the physical learning environment as well for students um when you have them in a classroom we know they're all in the classroom together um we have students that we we are aware that they they were they were <clears throat> doing classes in the bathroom um you know they were sitting in their bathroom because they were in a shared apartment um and one person was in the kitchen one person in the bathroom while they were trying to follow courses online um that's not a great environment to learn in um so so there are all these aspects that um as soon as you lose contact with the students um it becomes very difficult um you may remember back in 2011 there was um, uh, a tsunami, an earthquake and a tsunami in Japan, which led to the Fukushima um, uh, disaster. Now the Japanese government um, evacuated 150,000 people um, and there are actually very few um, uh, sort of repercussions in terms of immediate impact. But um, what happened afterwards was that, you know, there have been reports um, several years later saying that uh, the number of suicides have increased, that stress has increased. Um, and we, like I said, we're, we're, we're in the eye of the storm at the moment. This technology is great and it's, you know, it's given us a lot of opportunities but we need to be aware that um, learning is a social interaction um, and we learn because we're with people um, and, and we're talking to people. Um, and, and so the, the digitalization is a, is a tool that we have to, to, to master, um, but it's not a strategy by itself. Um, and we, you know, I've, I've seen and talking to lots of other schools as well, the students are so pleased to be back in the classroom. Um, they're so happy and so are faculty and so are all of us. Um, and the idea of a fourth uh, lockdown um, uh, is, is slightly terrifying um, um, because, you know, um, you know, we all want to, to sort of, you know, be interacting together. So I think it's something we don't realize at the moment, the repercussions of what this um, uh, has had. Um, I was just thinking, Jana. Of course, you 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 know you're in charge of um, the, the bachelor program. You, you may be getting to a stage where you have an entire cohort that have never really had, you know, a, a cohort of bachelor students that have never had a normal um, educational experience as we would imagine it. Um, what are the repercussions of that? Um, so I think this um, um, social learning, I saw Natalia on your slide, um, one of the criteria or uh, was resilience, um, you know, looking forward to 2025. Well, how do we accompany them for that? Um, are we qualified for it? Um, that's another question. Uh, you know, uh, are we academics that are there just to teach our subject or is there, you know, um, more pastoral care and well-being? Um, I know both EFMD and, and AACSB are very attached to this notion of, you know, taking care of the well-being of students, but I think that's a conversation we need to have very quickly about what what do we need to help our students through on this very difficult process and and what are our skills and competences and what are the boundaries we need to set um, um because there will be consequences that we will know about in five seven or ten years time that we don't understand today wow well <laughs> thank you very much it sounds like we have a fantastic opportunity in the future and we have to balance uh, between artificial intelligence and being networking uh, networked online mm. and uh, we actually depend on cross-cutton technologies and uh, well it's interesting that it also depends on their institutional level of involvement into digitalization and uh, support for physical environment and that is why I'm quite curious about their situation in China, because I know that, well, we are all amazed by the level of digitalization in China. And uh, it's a long way how we can be on the same level. And that is why I would like um, you, Professor Kunjan Lu, to share your experience on how your school reshapes their digitalization strategy and balance in the new circumstances. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, in my opinion, internet is generic technology. So it's not so difficult to thrive uh, once there's a basic infrastructure. Uh, 
Actually, the internet availability rate in China is over 70%, uh, which means nearly all students, especially college students, they can access to internet. Okay, so, oh, thank you. Please, next, next slide. Uh, globally, for example, at the beginning of 2020, because of uh, uh, the sudden COVID-19, some of our overseas students in Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America couldn't back, up, uh, couldn't back to classroom. So we start online teaching uh, via Zoom. Uh, but all those students uh, at the very beginning, they met uh, lots of difficulties. Uh, actually, they can prepare and solve those problems of internet access since uh, the second week or 10 days later. So from our case, the technology is not uh, the key issue, but what bothers us most is the time difference. Even now, some of our online classes are still arranged at local time, evening, even at night, uh, because the students are from different areas. Okay, but my opinion about uh, the online uh, education is, uh, okay, please next slide, uh, the last one. So uh, business school, I think is the joint link of society and the research. So our business school should first embrace the changing time and try to immerse uh, ourselves into this new era. Uh, we are in the ABCD era, we call it AI, blockchain, cloud, data. Uh, could you please, next slide. Digitalization is a means uh, and a methodology to enhance online teaching or online and offline combined teaching. Then digitalization is also the research object of business school. Through research activities, business school can understand the impact of the digitalization on company, society, groups, and individuals, and propose solutions based on, this, uh, based on this. And also we are in the era, we call it UCA. Uh, the so society is with uh, high complexity, ambiguity, uncertainty, and volatility. The pandemic crisis has forced business school so strengthen and invest more uh, into their digitalization. Uh, However, business schools should figure out what are the most pressing issues they are facing at the moment and what impacts they are having on their goals. Uh, take our schools as uh, the example. We are ACSB accredited at the beginning of 2020. The PRT's onset visit happened in uh, October 2019. I think maybe which was the last cohort of on-site PRT visit. And now we are doing equis, uh, even pandemic opportunity, always inside with challenges. Every year we have about uh, 200 students. They continue to go abroad for further study or exchange. Therefore, we prioritize our internationalization strategy, reshaping and innovating the tasks and goals. Uh, for instance, improve, uh, improving overseas student online teaching and learning experience uh, and try to cooperate with more schools uh, are very important for us at this moment. And uh, of course, uh, it is, uh, on the other side, it's quite convenient for us to organize more uh, academic conferences. Um, uh, at any era, I think the first principle for business school is to cultivate the responsible students. So we take OBE ideas, uh, outcome-based education, clearly focusing on an organizing teaching system uh, around what is essential for all students to be able to success at the end of the learning experiences uh, based on AOL, we measure the effectiveness and shift toward outcome-based education from learning goals to what students achieved to rearrange the education activities, including teaching and after-class activities. Okay, that's what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very inspirational presentation. While I really like the point that teaching students is doing the project, so it's uh, not talking the talk, but rather walking the walk instead of uh, 
just uh, given some theoretical underpinnings. And that's quite important. Maybe that's why students are still interested in academic mobility and studying in business schools. Lately, of course, we had these issues of uh, bringing students uh, to work and to go abroad uh, due to some extra constraints. But we are also trying to bring up the impact and uh, develop some international projects together. And I wanted to give a floor to Vyacheslav Dmitriev from Rain Business School to share their experience, how you are coping with this situation and how you engage students and uh, develop the quality of business school in such consequences. I forgot about my microphone. Um, yeah, well, I actually wanted to address two issues, which I found on the agenda. One is uh, glocalization, um, because I want to talk about this because being global is really part of uh, Rain School of Business uh, identity. We position ourselves as the most international business school um, in France, although Mark might uh, challenge what I'm saying. <laughs> we have 95% uh, of our faculty members being uh, uh, from, uh, from abroad, from international background, and 50% of our students, uh, maybe about 80% of our students at the master level. So uh, for us, we are global uh, by, by, by since birth, okay? We were born global. Uh, for me, what does it mean? It means that we don't have so many campuses abroad. Well, we don't have any campus abroad. We just went uh, to Paris, to the province, as we say. We established our first external campus. Uh, but uh, so we are not like uh, Catch, for example. We're not like uh, in Seattle. Uh, we don't go so much into the uh, uh, world, but we bring the global world to, to our campus. So for us, what this pandemic and this digitalization of uh, education, what is gonna change? Uh, probably not much. Uh, I don't see any potential benefits of uh, this situation for our global uh, position, but I think it might be a little bit of a threat given that now we give uh, opportunities for students to stay abroad and follow courses in a hybrid format or 100% virtual format. So. We are afraid that this might actually dilute our global uh, identity and uh, kind of uh, deviate our, us uh, from our strategy. So, but otherwise for other business schools who are not yet global or global yet, probably this creates an opportunity because as somebody mentioned with all these new teaching formats and so not only, I mean, virtual is not new, but hybrid, for example, that's new. With all these new teaching formats becoming more and more normal, uh, it's easier to bring in international speakers, professors, and even students from uh, from abroad. Right. Uh, second point is about the impact. Um, impact. Um, I want to address another another elephant in the room, which uh, we didn't talk about so far. Um, is the employability of our students. Well, we did mention that, but uh, to me, that's a, one of our missions as a business school is to, to, to increase our students' employability. Because, I mean, we talked about digital inequality. For us, at least in our school, it's not yet a, an issue. I mean, the cheapest uh, MSc program is 13,000 euros. Even with a scholarship, they still have to pay quite some money, right? So most of students can afford a laptop or a uh, stable Wi-Fi connection. But uh, um, we as a business school, we, we give promises to students, especially those coming from, uh, from other countries like India, Bangladesh, uh, Latin America, many developing countries. We give them promise that, of course, they will have a fantastic on-campus experience. They will learn um, a lot. They will have excellent uh, teaching um, learning experience. Uh, but we also implicitly give them a promise that they will be employable. And uh, lately, this pandemic really compromised our ability to fulfill uh, this, this promise. And many of these people, let's say, for example, our students coming from India, they, they often come from very modest backgrounds and they, they take student loans to, uh, to pay for their studies and accommodation in, in, in France. And we see it as a big social problem uh, that um, even before it was difficult for them to find jobs uh, in France or even back home, but now it's particularly difficult. 
and um, right so one thing one practice that we implemented uh, a couple of years ago well, basically it's just uh, when the pandemic started we actually created a new business unit or a department in the school it's called career service or career development and well-being it's pretty uncommon to put these two functions in one uh, business unit but for us it makes perfect sense um, because um, career counseling and psychological counseling they kind of uh, come together because this is really what our students uh, uh, need at the moment uh, we provide uh, counseling on demand and we help students to to find a job uh, uh, either either on uh, here originally or, or back at home in india so yeah so if to, if i had to answer the the question uh, on the agenda is it enough to be digital uh well definitely not really um, as somebody said uh, digitalization is just a tool it's not really a strategy it does uh, mitigate the negative consequences i mean all these new teaching formats for example they mitigate the consequences of pandemic we maintain uh, accessibility of uh, educational services to to people from abroad uh, but it doesn't solve all the problems i see bigger problems really in in um, in um, in uh, difficulties with employability and also psychological difficulties that students are um, experiencing that would be my answer thank you very much Vyacheslav. uh well that's very interesting is when uh, we were reshaping our program as a you know call back to our em employers demands we actually have got a reply from them that they don't want too much digital skills. They want a lot of soft skills integrated into, uh, you know, technical awareness of our students. So that's a new evolution of uh, competences that are required in the market. And they said that global vision in the world of, uh, you know, digital transformation is very much wanted. So that is why it's it's kind of a question um for uh croatia duro well how is the situation there in croatia are you also providing virtual traineeships or you're working on global models in these digital times how does it work for you you because our specific position we are the most international croatian business school before pandemia, one between four our students was international. We have a lot of uh, study abroad program, some very, very strong summer school program. And pandemia affect uh, strongly our international side of activity. Uh, but thanks to, uh, to our familiarization with uh, uh, distance e-learning e technology through last uh, 20 years uh, we invest a lot of in uh, familiarization of our student administration and faculty with uh, e-learning tools uh, we have experience with web ct platform blackboard platform lumen and a uh, lot of other tools and a uh, transition from uh, in campus to distance learning was relatively uh, smooth quickly but uh, because uh, because uh, widespread knowledge about how to use the tools but uh, then we start uh, with uh, every two week um, meeting where we uh, exchange best practice from the class between our faculty and uh, even uh, uh, regularly we maintain um, enquete to, to, to her what our students think with a new model of uh, lecture and uh, how we teach. Um, we have experience with, uh, of course, in class, and two model of hybrid uh, when when we have a full lockdown 
we teach uh, completely online. Then in uh, some period, we, we teach uh, for some number of students in class, but at the same time for some number of students who stay home and uh, stay in touch with uh, classroom through internet. And in a third stage, we, we teach uh, one week uh, distance learning, one week in uh, campus. We have, through that, through all that period, we collect a lot of uh, new experience, how to implement uh, possibility of new technology in our uh, learning process. What, what is, uh, and why, why we are optimists, uh, for example, in, uh, through all that period, we continue our international cooperation in some of, uh, in part of that, uh, completely through distance learning beca because we open our course for our uh, uh, partner and student from all over the world. But uh, after process of uh, vaccination increase, what we see is uh, that international student and of course our student uh, domestic uh, uh, enjoy to return to the campus. In the previous semester, we have a nice number of international students, but uh, why, why we are optimist in this semester, we have increase of 90%. Of course, a uh, part of activity like a study abroad program, like uh, summer school is uh, still affected. But uh, after three year of pandemic experience, we believe that uh, as a school, we will, uh, we will stay dominantly in, in campus, but uh, with uh, wide uh, application of uh, distance learning uh, tools, technology, and experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations on raising your international numbers by 90% in COVID times. That's quite impressive and uh, being offline as well. And uh, I, I would really uh, like to ask uh, Angelica how is that? Well, are you bringing more students offline or in digital mode? I, I was quite pleased to know that you have, uh, you know, online programs in uh, ABCD era on blockchain and stuff like this. Could you share your experience, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would like uh, to, to offer some context uh, regarding uh, our university and our school. Um, uh, Contrary to most business schools where um, the situation uh, uh, related to the pandemic brought them in front of uh, uh, decisions regarding uh, the use of technology in offering their programs, uh, we uh, go way back in 2013 when uh, um, in Cyprus there was a financial crisis which affected uh, drastically all uh, sectors of the economy, including um, our classes. I was offering at that time a class on software engineering. My background is in information systems, uh, which normally attracted a healthy crowd of about 40 students per semester. And um, next semester, I had three in class. So for us, at that time, it was very critical to, to see ways to uh, increase um, our attendees from overseas. And uh, fundamentally, we had to move along two axes. The first one, um, to develop programs that uh, were, in a sense, unique and uh, would attract possibly students to come and uh, study in Cyprus. And the second, and which is more relevant, to um, offer our programs online. So we started the digitalization process in 2013. And uh, within a year, uh, we have uh, developed uh, two uh, programs, the, the main programs of the School of Business, the undergraduate uh, program, um, 
bachelor in business administration and the postgraduate one, the master's in business administration being offered online um, and face to face. Um, we also had um, two uh, variants of these programs, one in English and one in Greek. And uh, um, the next uh, year, that was a tremendous breakthrough for us because uh, uh, we saw the, uh, the effects of uh, being open and being um, in connection with um, uh, our overseas uh, environment regionally. So we started uh, um, with uh, uh, offering other programs uh, with international appeal and you mentioned blockchain and uh, we are um, developing one on smart cities and one on metaverse right now. Uh, and this, uh, uh, these programs are meant to be internationally oriented and um, primarily offered in English. I'm saying all this because through uh, our involvement in the last uh, um, eight years, um, we came to realize that uh, we have to pay some more attention on uh, issues that um, quite often uh, are considered as uh, uh, abstract um, concepts and uh, perhaps uh, lead to towards uh, McDonaldization of uh, educational offering, as I would like to refer. Uh, we refer to technology as if uh, uh, there is a well-established uh, body of knowledge with regards to technology, whereas um, for us at least, it is a constant evolutionary um, way forward. Um, we use platforms that we regularly um, re-examine uh, with uh, regards to the benefits that uh, they offer to, to our students. And uh, um, we uh, are not afraid to move over, to migrate from platform to platform, especially for those program of ours that are considered to be of uh, prime interest. And uh, we are also have a group of people who re-examine what sort of tools we should incorporate in our platforms. So it is something that changes. Well, uh, I wouldn't say from one semester to the next, but definitely uh, within a two year cycle, uh, we have uh, quite a few changes when it comes to the tools that uh, we incorporate. We are constantly on the lookout of having um, environments that um, emulate the physical environments. For example, um, we incorporate uh, simulation and games, and uh, um, we were also um, happy to hear that this kind of attitude is uh, um, also adopted by our life science uh, faculty, and they have developed virtual labs in biology um, using uh, technology that is out there, but modifying to the curriculum that uh, they are interested in mostly. Um, and uh, if I have placed so much emphasis on technology so far, I would like to emphasize that for us, it's not technology first. Technology is an instrument, but pedagogy is uh, first. Pedagogy is uh, fundamental. And uh, of course, we, we all know that what is... Um, often cited that we were able to transfer uh, our programs online within two weeks. I mean, um, we offered the same programs most of the time in a different delivery mode within two weeks. But is this delivery mode appropriate for the type of medium that uh, we are talking about? Um, I'm afraid we should have, uh, uh, we should examine this point. It's not, um, directly transferable to take a, a class that is designed for face-to-face -face delivery and put it online and then say, okay, we, we are now on distance learning. No, I think things do not exactly work like that. Um, it is also fundamental for the type of period that we are in to constantly re-examine what kind of uh, content we should offer to, to our students. And I, um, uh, I, I believe it is um, important for every business school, um, certainly it is for us, to look out on the type of uh, new skills that uh, uh, we can develop and incorporate that not uh, through the official uh, curriculum, because this may not be so uh, easy at the time, but through series of uh, seminars, workshops, summer schools, um, you name it, uh, on uh, new emerging 
trends. And this has a dual effect. First of all, it offers satisfaction to our students that they are involved in something that is of cutting edge and uh, improves their employability. And secondly, it uh, raises a flag to potential employers here or overseas that, hey, something is being done there. Perhaps we should uh, explore further what uh, they are doing. Um, I would like also to say that uh, um, the next logical evolution after introducing new content in courses is to design uh, new programs. And new programs of study for the School of Business is, um, uh, yeah, is something that um, really requires the examination of uh, one's prioritization. Not everybody is leading towards this direction, but for us, I think it is a way forward uh, because of the idiosyncrasies of where we are and what we offer to come up with uh, uh, new programs of study. And I have mentioned um, one on smart cities and one on uh, smart cities management and one on uh, um, metaverse and N NFTs uh, that are going to be launched um, within uh, the next year. Um, in conclusion, uh, I would like to point out that uh, technology certainly is not enough, but uh, we have to pay attention to technology and we have to dynamically evolve to be ahead of uh, the competition um, and then use it as an instrument to come up with added value educational offerings to our students, um, affiliated partners and uh, um, overall the environment where we operate. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Angelica. And indeed, um, well, that's very important topics that you raised, uh, their link of employability, of different mode of education, different products in our digital education, and actually restructuring what we are doing, transformation of uh, digital education ecosystem. And I think uh, the most important today probably is to develop this uh, more flexible link between future careers of our graduates, be between their availability for different uh, new products and the ability of future business leaders to bring it up to the market and uh, to develop maybe their T-shaped skills. And that is why I would like to give a floor to Sergei Rushin to share with us what would be their digital transformation and what are their expertises. Uh... Dear colleagues, я опять буду говорить по-русски, поэтому, пожалуйста, перевод. Окей. Уже было очень много сказано, поэтому я постараюсь, может быть, очень... Дорогие коллеги, dear colleagues, I would like to demonstrate several points which are very important, judging from our experience. The experience of a large university which deals with education in different spheres of business. We've been conducting conferences together with Coursera, our very good partner, and we have five MA programs, MBA programs, and uh, very soon we're going to to think about this experience together. And I liked the presentation of uh, Natalia when she spoke about evolution rather than revolution. In my opinion, we have very fast evolution. It is evolution, but it happens very, very fast, much faster rather than anybody expected. And we have unexpected changes in educational technologies and in business technologies and markets are changing and uh, the portfolio of products is changing. What are the important things over here? First, we can see huge investments going into the technical side of education and it does change the landscape and the markets for business education. I dare say that we used to be able to create good products 
on the basis of different uh, business schools being leaders. And right now you can't be a leader and that's it. You have to work in collaboration with uh, very fastly developing IT sector. And very often IT sector does not or other sectors that do not grow out of business schools and uh, the largest MBA program is together with uh, a technological institution. We have about 130 students enrolled into that program and uh, it's very important experience for us. The second important thing is that when we transfer to new technologies, it gives us opportunities to work not as B2C, but also B2B between different business schools. We can combine, we can pool our resources, combine our products and get onto better positions on the market. We see how it grows and develops, but there is a specific inertia of uh, our thinking, which stops us in our development. But I believe that's one of the promising directions of our development. Yet another important factor we mentioned, yes, we change the technologies, the methods, the pedagogy of education, but uh, it will be working when we have learned two things. First, when we learn how to organize projects and cases online and who makes it better will win. And the next thing, we should use these online technologies, but it completely changes the system of controlling the knowledge or checking the knowledge. This is very important right now because offline you can completely differently check the competences, assess the skills of your students. And now we have to prepare a very different thing. And again, it can be an element of B2B cooperation between different business schools and other institutions. Yet another thing different people have mentioned today, what is happening in digital transformation dramatically increased the speed of changes. Yes, we have to change our programs, the content of our programs, but the problem is that we cannot think about it. We do not have time to think what is happening in the business because the business is changing very rapidly. And we have this inertia trap. We've been thinking about the situation which happened yesterday or the day before yesterday, and we fail to teach what is going to happen tomorrow. And that is a very important issue because the speed of transformation in business is so high that we should think of educational technologies and we should be very fast about thinking how business is changing. And that dramatically changes the business education. We used to be very calm and quiet. And right now, we, sh we cannot be calm and quiet. We should think very fast. And we should think about all these changes and accumulate this experience. And we should think of other new links between the leaders is business. And in our education, we should convert it into our new educational products. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, well, actually, uh, um, I think um, there wasn't re a research that when students are in class offline, um, they only have 10% of knowledge with them after the lecture. And when they are online with different integration techniques and all the new products, projects online, um, they actually have 45% of their soft skills and hard skills with them. And that is why we need indeed more platforms to integrate well-run projects. But I also think that 
that might depend also on new acceleration skills, digital skills. And that is why I would like to present you our uh, speaker, actually the Dean of Graduate School of Economics and Management, Dmitry Talmachev, uh, who will share their uh, some research results and will share what are the T-shaper skills that are in demand and how that differs between different schools and their place of their education. Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeanne. Hello, dear friends, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to try to ask uh, the question uh, where to find these new uh, skills, the information uh, about these new skills, uh, who could help to reshape uh, the existing uh, programs, uh, and uh, maybe how to uh, leverage the, the level of um, engagement of, um, of students. So um, the base is the survey, the research uh, that I mentioned uh, during the first plenary session. I will not repeat it, of course. I will just uh, point some important... Uh, uh, sorry, I, I need... Uh, the... Uh, sorry, I can't manage. Кто-то переключает там слайды, коллеги. Вот, пожалуйста, дайте мне возможность сделать это самостоятельно. I'm sorry, somebody is switching over the slides. Please do not switch the slides. I will do it myself. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Now, now it's okay. Okay, I continue. Uh, so this is the base. And uh, what is imp important, uh, one of the most important questions um, that um, uh, we, we tried to, to, to answer during this research was the education of the founders. So all the, um, the stages of, of the education. So I will give you a brief image of uh, uh, the founder, the Russian founder. So you could see here that uh, it's uh, difficult to understand uh, this slide, but nevertheless. Um, so the average age of the founder is about uh, 40 years now at the moment. So they are not young. Um, they have uh, the experience, work experience, so they have been worked uh, in three, um, in average, in three different uh, companies before 
starting before launching the the first startup uh, and the most part of them uh, so 1000 uh, more, more more than the half they are in the age of 25 35 i pass this slide uh, we also identified not only the Russian uh, education, but uh, the uh, foreign, foreign schools, uh, not only schools, but also uh, the accelerators uh, li like Y Combinator, etc., etc. So, um, uh, as the, the steps of uh, the educational way, uh, so. And now I pass uh, to, to the finish uh, of my presentation. So what is important? We have in identified um, among three, 350 Russian universities, uh, 25 universities uh, where the most part, 80% of these uh, techno startups um, uh, have studied. And also about 20 Russian business schools. Uh, business schools inside some universities. So you, you can, can see here, for example, number one is High School of Economics. It includes uh, all the business schools inside High School of Economics. And, uh, for example, Ural Federal University, it's, it also it, it includes my, my institute, etc. Uh, what is important? So, uh, during this survey, survey we, uh, we took... Um, uh, almost 100 of uh, interviews with them, with these techno found, uh, founders of techno startups. And uh, you know the link between these techno, uh, these founders and their alma maters is very, very, um, so there is a lack of, of communication. So the most part uh, of them are not identified uh, by, by the, the alma maters, uh, but they are eager to to collaborate with uh, alma maters. They uh, talk a lot about it. They they are eager to invest uh, their time. The time is the most important thing for them. Their time in um, educational programs, etc. So that is a really great source for Russian, not only Russian, this survey could be scaled on the any country. Uh, so a real source uh, of information, uh, so of including them in different entrepreneurial programs uh, of um, uh, changing the content, uh, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dmitry. That's very interesting um, outcomes that we got while we are all searching for new normal and we are looking for accelerated skills in digital environment. It seems that our entrepreneurial alumni, which, uh, well, and who already play important role in their world economy, could be an asset for us. And, uh, well, that actually plays... Um, important role with all those keywords that we named in the very beginning, uh, being digital, being agile, being T-shaped, uh, having no best practices, but having a number of, um, you know, projects uh, that lead others for a change, for a big change, and uh, being all together virtually, but connecting in networking communities, also in uh, improved projects and collaborations. Uh, I would like to ask all the speakers if you would like to add something. Uh, we also had in our chat uh, the question whether we should evolve further or stop at some moment and see whether it uh, correlates to the mindset of millennials. I think that's another topic of uh, conference, by the way, but if you have a short comment, we still have time for that. Andy, maybe you could uh, add on T-shaped uh, specialists. Mm -hmm. 
statistics that say that um, a very large percentage of jobs of graduates um, in the in the coming years are, are in areas that don't yet exist. Um, and therefore, I think it's very um, it's absolutely essential that we that our graduates are rounded, um, that they have the the kind of critical thinking skills that we would expect them to have coming out of university, that they have those soft skills. But and, and at the same time, they have a foundation of digital skills upon which they can adapt. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's getting that balance. And of course, there are challenges of, of how much time you've got in the curriculum to cover all of the subjects that the various accreditations require us to cover. Um, but it, I think it's, it's essential to try and get that balance and create that balance. And, um, and I know that, yeah, that's, that's a priority for, for many, of the, many of the leaders here. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. uh, can I just uh, add some remarks? Sure, the, sure. I just I like to share some uh, on the uh, in accordance with uh, the theme of the conference. I just want to share the positive experience we had uh, in the, through the pandemic period. And uh, some of you may know that we have. Uh, uh, we are very, um, our, the faculty is very international and we have uh, 70, 70 to 80% of our faculty members are non-Koreans. And also we have uh, approximately 70% of students are non-Koreans. And so we are, we trying to achieve diversity in the faculty and the and, and, and student body. But, uh, in, in terms of the faculty members, we always had the difficulties in recruiting expatriate lecturers in so-called high-cost countries, uh, such as the US and Europe. Um, we have uh, many, uh, uh, many the lecturers, expatriate lecturers, but um, we have only, only had a few, very limited number of uh, Americans and, and the Europeans in our faculty numbers. But now remote, Remote teaching has allowed us to reach out to them at the, at, uh, at the very manageable level of cost. And this semester, uh, we were able to recruit five uh, expatriates, uh, three Americans, and two of them are uh, the professors at the American universities, one freelancer, <laughs> American freelancer, digital lawmat. <laughs> And we were able to recruit uh, two lecturers from the UK. And so, so far we have very positive experience. And we are thinking about expanding uh, this, uh, this possibility. And then perhaps there's a strong possibility that we will expand it in the coming years. Okay, so I just want to share the, some uh, positive experiences we had with that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, in more yeah. teaching, online education. Yeah. yeah, I think we actually have positive, positive outcomes and we know what to use in the future strategy. And uh, even though we are being broadcasted now uh, to many countries uh, and uh, all the experiences will be used by other business schools as well. And this is a good sign to co-create new strategy for cooperation between the organizations that are presented here now in this plenary discussion. And also, I'm sure we will have lots of fruitful projects in uh, uh, digitalization, in new digital projects and also impactful projects, just like in the very beginning, Sergei Misayedov mentioned that we actually have a lot of cooperation in sustainability projects, in international projects, and also uh, we will go international and maybe go global as well. Well, it's not only about soft skills, but also about digital skills that we will develop all together. Uh, but we still look forward to their new normal back to offices and campuses. Thank you very much to all the participants of this panel. Hope we all use the experiences that we've discovered and accelerate them. And I hope to see you all, dear virtual guests in Yekaterinburg, the heart of Russia, and uh, further bring your academics, students, and research 
to hear and take some from here. Thank you very much. Hope to Thank see you. you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.